So I presented a phase two single center investigator initiated study looking at obinutuzumab in combination with lenalidomide and high tumor burden, previously untreated follicular lymphoma patients. The reason we thought this was an important study is we had done prior trials looking at rituximab in combination with lenalidomide, exploiting the microenvironment in follicular lymphoma. It's a disease that most patients will respond, but most will also have experienced relapse and succumb to their disease. So we still think that if you could provide an effective but well-tolerated strategy, that would be beneficial for patients and for us. So we set out to replace the rituximab with obinutuzumab, which we think is potentially a better antibody, particularly when you're pairing it with immune therapy. It is a single center phase two study. We recognize that there are limitations in that, but we had 90 patients, um, again, all high tumor burden. Most were advanced stage, including stage four. Um, most were good performance status. And again, in terms of the dosing schedule, we tried to replicate what was done in the relevant studies. So what that means is patients had an induction of um, more intensive therapy. So they got obinutuzumab on day one, eight and 15 of the first cycle, and then day one of cycles two through six. Lenalidomide was dosed at 20 milligrams on days one through 21 of a 28-day cycle. And at cycle six, if patients were in a complete response, they could then roll into a maintenance, which was a lower dose of Len at 10 milligrams daily. Uh, and that was continued cycle seven through 18, again, similar to what was done in relevance. And the obinutuzumab from cycle seven all the way through cycle 30 was dosed every other cycle. Recognize it's a long duration of treatment, but again, to try and replicate what was done with the prior antibody, we thought that would be the most consistent way to try and compare across studies. And what we showed is that response rates were very high, so very high complete response rate, but what was very dramatic about it is almost all patients who achieved a complete response did so by cycle four day one, which was their first response assessment. Also, what was quite striking is that the two-year progression-free survival estimates, albeit very short follow-up, about 25 months, was 96%. So among the 90 patients, we only had three patients that had a progression event within two years. In follicular lymphoma, that time point is actually relative because patients who experience a progression event within 24 months are generally facing a very poor uh, prognostic uh, situation. So again, if we can delay those number of early events, I think this is a very effective strategy. Now, anytime you move into frontline follicular lymphoma, you have to ensure that safety is uh, appropriate. So we saw no grade five adverse events, and actually most of our toxicity was grade one or two and very manageable. Now we did have about 20% of patients stop treatment early, and that's probably reflective of bias that you may not need that long of treatment, because the patients that did stop, most stopped after 13 cycles of treatment, and almost all of those patients were in a complete response when they stopped therapy. So I think this is a very effective strategy. It's very promising in high tumor burden, advanced stage follicular lymphoma, and should be studied further. I think the question that remain is, what is the optimal duration of treatment? Obviously, if patients are responding very dramatically very early, you may not need 30 cycles of treatment. So we hypothesize that obinutuzumab, because there's higher rates of neutropenia, uh, particularly in comparison to rituximab, that you might see more particularly grade three or higher neutropenia, we really didn't in our uh, experience is very similar to what we've seen with rituximab and lenalidomide. Uh, so only 17% of patients had grade three or higher neutropenia, very few uh, events of neutropenic fever. And we didn't use prophylactic growth factors, so reactive growth factors were only used in 13% of the patients. And outside of neutropenia, the other more common side effects were GI toxicities, and again, mostly grade one or two. It's a very manageable toxicity profile.